It's now 6 o'clock a.m. on February 17th, 2024. I've sat with the Lord I am for the last six hours, and he has completed in me the prophecy to the mountains of Israel. And I will now bring forth that prophecy in completion in this video. Ezekiel 36 verses 1 through 15 prophesies to the mountains of Israel. Israel represents all men whom God rules, which God tells us repeatedly through the scripture, is all men. He will rule in all men. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. All Israel will ultimately dwell within the city of God, New Jerusalem. The mountains of Israel are the overcomer foundation stones of New Jerusalem itself. That's the definition. The mountains of Israel are the overcomer foundation stones of New Jerusalem itself. New Jerusalem is coming. Thus they are the mountains of Ezekiel 36, they are the governing authority of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is now coming to earth. Through Ezekiel, God tells the world the tragic history of his mountains of Israel. That's in verses 1 through 7 of Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> in verse 5, God says that Edom, quote, gave my land to themselves as a possession. Edom, in scripture, represents the carnal nature of man, the carnal nature of Adam. Edom and Adam are the same entity in scripture. Edom is the playing out of the carnal nature of Adam in the world today. Edom rules the world. <clears throat> Edom and Adam are both ruddy red and bloody men. They can only be saved, they can only be redeemed, they can only be ransomed by the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb, Jesus Christ. This is why God clothed Adam and Eve with animal skins. Their shed blood typified the blood of Christ that redeems us from our sin, our man of sin, our son of perdition, our carnal man. The fellowship of the mystery of God, the plan hidden from the ages which God now reveals, is that God used his creation, specifically his creation of Adam, to reproduce himself in physical reality, which itself would ultimately become spiritually perfect and holy, just as our Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ, are. Jesus is called the Son of God because he was birthed in the flesh in this world of men. This is why he refers to himself as the Son of Man, especially in the book of John, and look at John 1, verse 51. <clears throat> Jesus was born with the DNA of Eve and the DNA of Father God, his Father. He had none of Adam's old DNA, and therefore he had no carnal nature. He had no old man. He is the new man. Only two men exist, the old man or, or the new man. Which man are you? Jesus came that we might become a new man. Most of us still are the old man. The old man, Adam, serving our carnal nature. The new man is called Christ. Every Kodeshim overcomer, <clears throat> every holy one, Kodeshim means holy one, every Kodeshim overcomer had to make himself ready to become a foundation stone of New Jerusalem by overcoming the son of perdition. 
the man of lawlessness. It is for this reason that God left the carnal man, Adam's nature within us, when he birthed the new man named Christ within us. Christ in us, Emmanuel. John 1.12 tells us this new birth that came to all who received him and believed in his name, that he gave them the right to become sons of God. This is the only right we truly have in this world today. This right came to them because those who truly received and believed in Jesus, that is, that Jesus is God the Father in the flesh. This is the mystery of the Father. Jesus is God the Father in the flesh because he was born of God. He was born of the Father. All who receive and believe this have been born of God, according to John chapter 1, verse 13. Jesus tried to explain this to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and Nicodemus could not understand. And most people today cannot understand. When a man is truly born of God because of faith in the word of God, he receives the earnest of the Holy Spirit, which creates in him a new man that cannot continue sinning, according to 1 John 3, 9 and 1 John 5, 18. But God allows the man of sin to continue growing in the born-again man so that this potential son of God can learn to overcome and conquer the man of sin. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans chapters 7 and 8, about him doing the things he doesn't want to do. But in 8, he says, If I will live according to the Spirit, then I will live. But if I live according to the flesh, if I live according to the carnal man, I will die. This is the mark of the overcomer. He will not take the mark of the beast, the mark of sin, Cain's mark, the mark of the son of perdition. And now we live at the end of this age. Darkness covers the earth. Edom, the son of perdition, rules the world. Edom is antichrist. Edom who represents all men from Adam who do not overcome Antichrist, like Jacob Israel did by faith, in I am, rules in the place of Christ. Antichrist means to take the place of Christ. And that's what Edom has done. Edom has taken his place as the ruler of this world in place of God, in place of Christ. He rules everywhere everywhere, except for the few, very few, remaining mountains of God. And they want to destroy all of the mountains of Israel, all of the mountains of God. I am one of those mountains, and I'm about to be cleaved. My old man will soon be stricken from my being. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 1 through 7, prophesies now to the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel 36, verses 1 through 7, prophesies now to God's overcomers who are alive and who remain. This prophecy is to you, the overcomers of God, the Kodeshim who still exist, the mountains. Listen. God now says, God now says, your enemy, the enemy of every overcomer, are all the natural and spiritual elements of our creation who actively do evil who devise, plan, and carry out evil agendas in their multitude of clubs, churches, mosques, governments, 
non-governmental organizations called NGOs, like WEF and all businesses. Now our enemy publicly says, oh yes, all the ancient heights, all the great things of the earth have become our possession. We make all the decisions and all the laws of the world. We decide if you will eat and drink, and we decide what you will eat and drink. We decide whether you will live or die, with or without diseases that we create. And then control with our clever use of sorcery in what we call your healthcare system. We decide when and where to begin wars. We control your weather. We decide whether you can plant your own food, plant your own garden, own your own home, build your own business. We decide whether to bring you into bankruptcy through taxation or deliberate economic practices that bankrupt you. We decide if people can freely move through countries' borders without any legal restrictions. And we decide whether our citizens that we rule with terror must acquire a real ID in order to get on an airplane and in order to travel legally through your particular nation's border into another nation. <clears throat> now, all of God's ancient heights, everything he used to control, have become ours, says Edom, loudly to everyone on earth, and says your maker, Jesus, your creator. They say this boldly with pride and smugness to your face every day through their totally controlled media. Precisely for all of these many reasons, because Edom, your enemy, made you utterly desolate and crushed you from every side and stripped you of your very ability to exist and function as human beings in this world of man, this world of Adam, this world of Edom. The word of the Lord now comes to the mountains of Israel. Behold, I'm about to do a new thing in the earth. I will now cleave my overcomer mountains, known by me as the Mount of Olives, where I was crucified at its southern summit named Golgotha, that school-shaped hill which represents the battle for men's minds that I spiritually named Armageddon, the battle for your mind, the battle for your soul, the battle for your life. Now I will cleave the Mount of Olives. Now I will cleave Golgotha, your place of sin and death, from you. Now I will remove your heart of stone, your carnal, sinful man who is the son of perdition, pass to you through your father Adam. Now I will glorify myself in you, for it is time for you to arise and shine so that all nations of earth, all nations past and present, which includes nations like Sodom and Gomorrah, and even ancient Babel, will come to your light and all the rulers of the earth will come to the brightness of your rising. Read Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 5. Now you, O mountains of Israel, the overcomers of God, the Kodeshim, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people, Israel, for they will soon come home. These mountains of Israel are the shoot from the stump of Jesse and the branch from Jesse's roots, according to Isaiah 11, verse 1. <clears throat> the stump of Jesse is the natural genetic line passing from Eve to Jesse to David to Jesus. This line culminated in Jesus Eve's seed prophesied in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This seed bruised Satan's head at Golgotha by conquering death. 
This began the process of renewing man's carnal mind in order to restore man's relationship with God. This is the battle of Armageddon that we all fight today. Our creator Jesus is the root, the source of Jesse. The branch from that root is not Jesus, for he is the root. The branch is the company of all overcomers, the mountains of Israel. All of the sons of God who used their right to become a son, according to John chapter 1, verse 12. <clears throat> God called his chosen nation Israel, those people who were descended from Jacob, out of Egypt to be his son, who would then act as a kingdom of priests. Read that in Exodus 19, verses 1 through 5. A true priest, like Jesus, acts as an intercessor between God and men, to whom God is not reconciled. <clears throat> in the same way as that priest and his God, a priest acts as an intercessor between God and man. Moses always interceded for the people when they sinned. He brought judgment when he had to, for example, Aaron's calf, Korah's rebellion, and the fiery serpents. But then his final waters of Meribah experience, the waters of contention, disqualified him because he struck the rock twice instead of speaking directly to the rock as commanded by God. Numbers 19, verse 8. The waters of Meribah events occur at the very end of Israel's 40-year wilderness journey out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Miriam died just before this event. That was in Numbers 19.1. Aaron died just after it because, God said to him, you, Moses, rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. God thus charges Moses with Aaron's failure to enter the kingdom. God told Moses to speak to the rock for its water, not to strike the rock. He struck the rock the first time that symbolized the crucifixion of Christ. The first time striking the rock. Jesus is our rock. And especially he did not tell Moses to strike the rock twice. To strike the rock twice means to crucify Christ a second time. Read Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 through 8 and especially verse 6. Striking the rock twice means <clears throat> to sin deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth according to Hebrews 10, verse 26. And if you will look at that, you'll see that comes right after Hebrews 10, 25. That misinterprets the whole idea of the second coming of Christ at the Episanugogi, which we are all to be watching for. Moses struck the rock twice and was disqualified. He could not enter the promised land. This does not mean that Moses is not an overcomer. He is an overcomer. He was, he was serving a prophetic type when he did this, a prophetic type of which we see many today. The nation of Israel did this as two separate entities and both were disqualified. The Northern Kingdom first, that ended up being uh, fulfilled and represented in what is called the Christian Church for the last 2,000 years. And then the southern kingdom itself was disqualified after they crucified Jesus. God now sweeps both northern and southern kingdoms to destruction as he cleaves the Mount of Olives and destroys Golgotha, the hill of the skull, the place of the mind, the carnal nature of man that must be lost because he cannot ever be saved. He is the son of perdition. He is the son of destruction. He is the lawless one, the man of sin, the beast that rises from the sea, the beast that rises from the earth, the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist. He is the one who sits in the holy place of the temple of God, which is man's heart. 
That's where the Antichrist sits. If you have not overcome the man of sin. And he proclaims that he is God. He sits in your heart. He sits in everyone's heart who is not an overcomer and proclaims that he is God. Instead of the true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. By doing this, man raises himself above me according to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, and proclaims that he is God. He makes his ways higher than my ways and his doings better than my doings. This is the sin and the way of all men. Even Moses, Miriam, Aaron, David, Solomon, even Job. It is also the sin of every overcomer, including me until now. And it was just within the last two weeks that this final sin of Job was destroyed. Daniel understood this. He interceded for his people without disqualifying himself because he included himself in his prayer for them. He interceded for them. Daniel stood in the gap so that God would not destroy his people. Will the end time, Kodashim, intercede like Daniel? Or will they, like immature overcomers James and John, strike the rock twice and call down fire from heaven to literally destroy all men? That's what the Bible sounds like it's saying, isn't it? Do we want to see everything destroyed? Or do we want to see all men saved? Read Daniel chapter 9. True overcomers become the fire that draws all men to me. I am coming now to kindle my fire upon all the earth so that all men will know that I am God, not them. I will now cleave the son of perdition from man's heart, all men's hearts, and they shall all know me. From the least to the greatest, all shall know me. And all men shall come into my house, my city, called New Jerusalem. For I shall cleanse every one of all sin and defilement by the fire of truth, the fire of the word of my holy ones, my Kodeshim, my son, the man-child, whom I now release into the world. Now, <clears throat> Psalm 40, especially verses 6 through 8, it is written in the volume of the book concerning Jesus that God does not delight in sacrifice and offering. Now I cast out the idle church of the Jews and the northern kingdom of Israel. Now I cast out Jew and Gentile and all Edom, all mankind, who lifted themselves against me and who have utterly destroyed my holy ones from under all heaven. You want to cast them off the earth, but I now cast you off. Now you must find them. Now you must go to them if you want to eat, if you want to drink, if you need shelter, and if you need clothing. Your plan for them to eat bugs and to own nothing has failed. You have dug the pit for their destruction, but now you will fall into the pit that you dug for yourselves. Now I birth my son, now I call him out of Egypt, out of this world system I named Babylon. Now you will obey him, my branch, and you will go to him for your needs, for your great city Babylon I destroy now. <clears throat> in my branch are the seven spirits of God. They will rest in fullness upon him, upon my man-child. The man-child delights in me alone, the way, the truth, the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
The man-child, my branch, judges in righteousness and justice with equity. My man-child, my foundation of New Jerusalem is righteousness and truth. My man-child shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God, just as the waters cover the sea. At this time, the root of Jesse, who is Jesus, shall stand up as a signal for his people, and all nations shall inquire of him and rest in him. No longer will my people, no longer will all men lean and depend upon him who struck them. The one who struck them is the son of perdition. For I now cleave this lost one from my new man. Now the remnant is released. The remnant from all the nations of earth shall come into true faith. Jealousy over religious views will end. The remnant who now come into true faith will become the leaders of those who still dwell in the salt marshes of Ezekiel's vision of New Jerusalem, found in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48. Now, says I am, I will devote to destruction. I will utterly destroy. This is why Israel had to utterly destroy certain things when they came into the land in the book of Joshua. <clears throat> now says I am, I will devote to destruction the tongue of the sea of Egypt. I will destroy that abyss in man which caused him to rebel against me and raise himself above me. No more shall his voice be heard on earth to deceive, betray, and destroy my people. Now, I will save the remnant of his people, the remnant of Assyria, who always fought against my truth, who always fought against my Kodeshim, who always killed and persecuted my holy ones. Now, even the idolatrous Assyrian shall give thanks to their newly found God. Now the Assyrian unbeliever comes to faith in Yeshua and knows he is also their salvation. Now the Assyrian will drink the pure water of life from the wells of Yeshua, who is Jesus Christ. Now the Assyrian will thank Yeshua and will begin to also preach the gospel in his name. Now the Assyrian will sing praises to I am, for he glorified himself in his Kodeshim. I am glorified himself in his Kodeshim in order to reach even unto the Assyrian for salvation. Now the Assyrian will call to the overcomers already in Zion, New Jerusalem, and finally will proclaim God, the Holy One of all Israel, all mankind, and they will say that God truly does dwell in their midst. Then even the idolatrous church, the idolatrous churches, the idolatrous Jews, the forsaken northern and southern kingdoms of ancient Israel will finally respond to my truth and receive and believe in me, Jesus, the Christ, the only true God. End of prophecy to the mountains of Israel.